Today we will hear from two esteemed guests, Lisa Talia Moretti and Phil Harvey. I would like to first share some remarks to set the context for today's session. We will then hear from our speakers who will share insights on how we navigate the potential pathways of intelligent buildings, their identities and control. Followed by our speakers' presentations, we will open up the session to questions. We would invite all of you to submit your questions using the chat panel throughout today's event so that you can get involved in our, in our conversation. If I can briefly start by setting the context, I would like to say that over the last decades, intelligent buildings were only a conceptual framework to describe the buildings of the future. However, today, as we increasingly rely on the intelligence of the environments we live and work in, the principles of intelligence underpin the design and development of buildings to offer efficiency, promote interaction, enhance health and well-being, provide security, minimize cost and risk, as well as build resilience for a thriving future. In this growing demand, as our needs develop in complexity, there is also an increasing need for built environments to be designed for long-term health and well-being of the occupants. What Professor Derek Clements Crom refers to in his study on intelligent buildings, we need a more caring and humane approach in buildings of today and the future that offsets the hard face of construction and technology. As an intelligent building is also too often associated with a built environment that efficiently or autonomously operates because of an integrated building management system or because of an amazingly complex and perhaps um, advanced technological systems and gadgets that are put on it. But surely a building is beyond this mere description of an object with add-ons. It is where our lives are mostly spent. So intelligence of a building is far deeper in layers than we typically see or perceive on the surface. In today's event, we wanted to explore what we can learn from multidisciplinary digital teams when it comes to designing intelligent machines and complex technical systems that can perhaps unravel some of those layers we do not immediately see or appreciate in intelligent buildings. It is now my pleasure to once more welcome our speakers to today's event and briefly introduce them each before their presentations. Thank you, Lisa and Phil, for your time today. We're glad you were able to join us and we're very much looking forward to hearing your take on designing for intelligence in buildings of the future. If I may briefly start by introducing Lisa first. Lisa Talia Moretti is a digital sociologist currently working at the Ministry of Justice here in the UK. She is also a lecturer at Goldsmiths, Cardiff and Plymouth Universities. For more than a decade, Lisa has researched and written about the relationship between technology, information and society. Her internationally recognized research covers a range of technologies, including AI, chatbots, VR, AR and wearable technology. In 2020, Lisa was named one of Britain's 100 people who are shaping the digital industry in the category Champion for Change. She sits on the AI Council for the British Interactive Media Association and is also on all, part, all party parliamentary group task force for blockchain cities. If you haven't seen it yet, her extraordinary TEDx talk on technology is not a product, it's a system, is available online and I would highly recommend everyone to watch it. Hi Lisa, welcome again. Please, um, over to you and thank you for your presentation. Thank you so much, Mina, for such a lovely introduction. I really appreciate that so much. I'm going to be sharing my screen. And after we have tested this, it doesn't seem to be working. Let me see. So thank you so much for having me today. I really, um, it's lovely to be here or with you. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about this topic over here, so how to build intuitive services and collaborative tech. 
Um, that's me. Um, so like Mina said, I am a digital sociologist. I'm currently working at the Ministry of Justice. I'm quite new to working in government. I have been working with the UK government now for just more than two years. And the predominant, um, my, my experience is predominantly actually in the private sector, working across a range of different organizations um, and predominantly in tech. But I have done a little bit of work uh, with uh, me uh, membership organizations like UKGBC and um, most recently uh, with the World Health Organization. So a lot of what I share with you today uh, has been informed by my research that has been taking place over multiple different sectors across multiple different organizations. And so hopefully there will be lots in here that feels relevant to you and that you can take away with you today. But first of all, um, let me just touch on a little bit about what is digital sociology and what is a digital sociologist. This is a question I get asked very often and need to uh, just put some words and give it a bit of a shape. Essentially, digital sociology is this. It's about new ways of coming to know society by studying what emerges at the intersection of technology, media, social research and social life. Put simply, digital sociology is about coming to understand and know society in new ways. And by doing that, by reimagining the internet as a site of research, reimagining the kind of data that we have access to by looking at the internet and seeing it for the multiple different layers of information and data that it, that it has available to it. So it's not just about us thinking about the different algorithms or data sets that sit behind that within the infrastructure of the internet, but thinking about things like post demographics or how studying links and how they connect to one another across the internet can show us politics of association and networks of association. Um, we think a lot about uh, network content and uh, the different kinds of spheres that we can perhaps study. So like the social sphere, which is about the collection of social networks and the content that lives in that space, or the blogosphere, which is sort of a network of blogs and the content that lives in that space. So that's a little bit about my discipline. But what I'm really here to talk to you about today is really talking to you about my research uh, that I've been doing over the last sort of 15 years of working in the technology space uh, across private and public sector. And the role that I often take is to help organizations build what they call intuitive services and build these really seamless customer experiences. The kind of key to an intuitive service is to make sure that human and technology is working in collaboration with one another. And there are particular building blocks that are required um, if you wish to build an intuitive service, if you wish to kind of create this collaborative technology. And these are sort of six building blocks that I'm going to share with you today. The first is empathy. Then we're going to talk about accessibility. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about reciprocity, adaptability, privacy from a slightly different angle to the one that you might uh, um, imagine. And then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about serendipity. So let us start with empathy. Empathy is not just about a feeling. It's not just about emotions, but it's about really connecting with the people that you are designing your technology for, your product or your service for. It's about really understanding what kind of position and place in the world they take. It's about understanding the experiences that they have. And so when we talk about this feeling, it's not just about a feeling. It's really about this idea of resonating. Can you see the world from their perspective and really understand where they're coming from? Without empathy, you cannot build the rest of your foundations for your intuitive service because empathy is actually the foundation of a relationship because it is the foundation of trust. And this is especially true when you are trying to establish new relationships with people. We don't see this so much in government where I'm working at the moment, but certainly in the private sector, we have started to see how these new technologies like virtual reality have the opportunity to create entirely new worlds and experiences for people. But these new experiences are profoundly impactful on a person, 
profoundly impactful on their lives, on their human bodies. And what we can start to see is that the brain doesn't entirely um, understand that it's not experiencing the real world. And so the body responds in a similar kind of way. So the same kinds of hormones that are released when somebody is having a really exciting, happy, joyful experience out in the real world, the same kinds of hormones um, are released actually when somebody is experiencing that online. And so as a result, if you are using some of these very uh, new emerging technologies like virtual reality, augmented reality, you know, sophisticated kind of technologies around artificial intelligence, you yourselves as the creator, as the designer, you have to set your empathy levels to high when you are designing these, because what you can create and what you are going to create will have a profound impact on somebody's, on somebody's body and how they feel. And that's a huge responsibility to take. Now, the reason, uh, another reason why empathy is so important is because you will be, have to meet lots of people who are not like you, whose experiences are completely different to your own. And we see this a lot in the space around accessibility. Now, in the offline world, um, in the physical world where we all um, live and um, inhabit, when you go to new buildings or when you move around the world, that those physical spaces have had to be adapted for people who have um, different kinds of needs, accessible needs. So, you know, whether that is a ramp where instead of a um, set of stairs, or if somebody requires a hearing aid, or if somebody requires glasses, or the little um, um, uh, braille um, um, points on um, traffic lights, all of those kinds of types of accessibility features and tools in the offline world need to be brought with you when you are designing things online. And so we, for a very long time in technology, we were very bad at doing this, but more and more we're starting to see that there are a huge range of tools and features for people who are blind, um, for people who have trouble um, with hard of hearing, but also with those who have neurodiversity differences, with those with learning disabilities, with mobility challenges and assistive technologies. So the message really here is when you are designing these new technologies, uh, designing these new um, products and services, you have to keep in mind that not everyone is going to come and experience this service, experience this, um, this new product that you have from the same perspective or from the same life experience that you have. And so you have to really imagine this diverse group of people that you are going to be designing for and make sure that you have the right kinds of tools and features that everyone can ex experience parity of service. The next thing I really wanted to talk about today is reciprocity. Our relationship with technology has radically changed. And as technology has become smarter, we are starting to learn a lot from technology about ourselves. There is a lot of work that has started to go into um, this, um, where people are starting to write about the very intense and deep nature um, that people are starting to develop with technologies. So people who are finding that they are experiencing very strong attachments to um, assistant um, AI that can talk back to them. So for instance, like voice activated AI, uh, like Alexa and Siri, where people are actually using those technologies as a way to satisfy loneliness, um, to satisfy certain anxieties. So one of these things that, that, I mean, that's a tremendous new step for mankind to have this kind of reciprocal relationship and to develop these new reciprocal relationships um, with, with tech. But it does require a unique kind of digital literacy. And it raises a bigger question for all of us in society is whose responsibility is it to teach uh, society, the next generation, how to teach a machine. Because as we can see uh, from some of the examples of things that have gone wrong, is that we can teach the machine very bad habits. 
So there's a very famous case study in the world of technology, um, sorry Phil, where Microsoft released a chatbot called Tay um, and they released it on Twitter. And the idea was that the community would interact and engage with Tay and would teach her how to respond and how to chat and that the community would essentially raise Tay. And what happened was is that people started to teach Tay very bad things. They started to talk about things that were racist uh, towards certain groups um, and with very bad language. And so within 48 hours, uh, Tay had to actually be taken down by Microsoft. But it was a very good example to the rest of the tech community about how important it is to think about when you are designing a relationship and are trying to establish relationships between machines and humans, how do you design the right kind of experience that allows for a human to positively teach that machine so that it may get, so that the human may reap the greatest benefits um, from that machine. Adaptability is a really interesting one and it requires a lot of collaboration across different business businesses, different sectors, different markets. And this is the desire that many customers, many consumers are starting to um, expect from us to have very seamless experiences. So the idea that they only want to enter information once, that once they have visited a website, they're expecting a certain kind of adaptability to their particular need state. But they're also expecting an elevated level of intelligence around technology that is very difficult to often meet that expectation. But they're essentially expecting for the technology to really understand the environmental context in which they are and provide them the best kind of experience that is best suited for that environment. And it goes one step further. People are expecting to provide to be able to provide machines with a very minimum in order to get a maximum amount in return. So this idea of how can we use artificial intelligence to better understand human intent, but also to better compute the environment that that person is in and to adapt the experience accordingly. People are also expecting to be able to move across their lives um, and their daily lives and for that experience, should they wish to continue that experience to, for it seamlessly to move across different devices and both online and offline. At a very small level, you can start to see how this happens if you start watching a video on YouTube on your phone and you're logged into your Google accounts. And then you stop watching that video and then you open that same video up on your laptop and you can hit play and it will actually start playing again if you're logged into your account from that place where you ended off um, on your phone. But it's that kind of adaptability, that kind of seamlessness that is um, really changing the nature of what it means to have a good digital experience, to, de to deliver a really intuitive service for someone. One of the big stumbling blocks that is really standing in our way is that we require silos to really collapse in order for this to work um, and for this to be able to really happen. And even we see this with some of the technologies, just trying to get, for instance, um, Android um, products working on Mac devices, on iOS. There's a huge challenge there in itself. Um, different um, apps working on different um, type of operating systems. It can be really frustrating. So if we wanted to take this even to another level um, where we want, for instance, uh, data from the NHS to be shared seamlessly with the, the hospital that we're going to go to or the operating room and that kind of experience, we have to really re-engineer the entire system. And this requires a different shift in how we think about technology because it changes our understanding of technology from being purely a product to technology actually being a system. And how do we not just design for these different single devices, but how do we actually connect the system up so that it becomes much more adaptable, much more intuitive, much more understanding of that person's intent and the overall environment in which they're operating in. 
The next thing I wanted to chat to you about is around privacy. And this is not just about, this is not about hacking and this is not just about keeping data safe, although both of those things are incredibly important and cybersecurity is a hugely important topic. GDPR is a hugely important topic, but those are not topics I'm going to be discussing uh, today when I'm talking about privacy. This kind of privacy that I'm talking about is this real big rise that we're seeing in digital detoxes and digital strikes. So people wanting to remove themselves from a digital environment because it is so overwhelming, because their lives are so saturated with screens. And we can start to see how people curiously are using technology to be able to disconnect from technology. So this is from things like wearable tech. Um, so there's a brand um, called Ringly, where um, it's a series of jewelry and you can purchase that jewelry, you can program that jewelry to um, alert you to certain notifications that come up on your phone. But essentially you can, the idea is that you can put your phone away so that you don't have your phone as a distracting device. And your phone will alert you only when there are particular messages from particular people that you wish to be um, alerted to and notified of. So it's a really interesting kind of uh, connection here between wanting to stay connected, but using certain technologies to disconnect so that you can be more focused, so that you can kind of get out of that digi um, digital saturation. And I think post COVID, what we are going to start seeing is a rise in much more sound um, generated um, technologies and um, sound connected technologies or audio connected devices. I think we're st going to start seeing sound as a real dominant category and sound as, a, as an interface um, really start to rise and perhaps even take over um, at some point, maybe in the very future, or be on par on parity with with so many screens that we that we deal with on a day to day. And the very last uh, topic I wanted to talk to you today is probably the one that is most fun to have to be able to play with as a designer and as a researcher, and that is uh, serendipity. There is something quite curious that has happened within the artificial intelligence space, and that is there is a desire to teach machines and to, to be able to tailor certain experiences and to be able to personalize. And I know that I've spoken about this, um, this desire for machines to understand human intent, but there is, um, there's a different, um, there's a curious sort of uh, friction to that, and that is that human needs are changing all the time. And we have found through our research that this overly persistent desire to, to personalize actually leaves somebody feeling like there have been their um, possibilities or their opportunities have been reduced. And what people are wanting is to use technology in a way that allows them to be able to be curious and to be able to discover things in the world or to indeed discover things about themselves. And so any kind of technology that actually reduces somebody's opportunity, reduces their opportunity to be curious or to discover, we actually find that there's a real pushback to this type of technology and people don't really trust it. They don't really want to develop this reciprocal nature with this technology because it feels really forced and it doesn't feel real. It doesn't feel authentic to them. So again, the kind of kind of key message here is this really trying to remember that while there are lots of these um, tools like technology and machine learning that can offer very positive opportunities around training a system, when it is used um, in a sort of obtuse way with humans, it doesn't work so well because humans really crave newness. They really want to push boundaries. They really want to discover. And so it's this really interesting balance when you are designing these intuitive services, when you're designing collaborative technology, that you place serendip that you place serendipity and consistency on a spectrum, and you play with that spectrum to see what works for certain products, certain services, and certain different types of audiences. 
And I'm going to leave you over there and we can have a conversation about that. I look forward to your questions, but I think it is now going to be Phil's turn to present. Thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you for that very inspiration and thought provoking presentation. I think we rarely consider the implications of technology in the way you have mentioned them today. Um, it was quite fascinating for me to hear how you talk about empathy and reciprocity, sort of digital literacy, etc., in the context of uh, technology and it's sort of like the new realities we experience as a result of technological advancement. So this is has been quite an eye-opener um, session and presentation for me. Thank you for that, and hopefully it's the case for our audience as well. Um, but more to talk about that in the Q&A session of our event. Now I want to turn to Phil, um, to our next speaker, Phil Harvey. If I may briefly introduce you, Phil. Um, Phil is a senior cloud architect for data and AI in Microsoft. Um, his interest in empathy, ethics, and the impact of uh, data on people has let him gain experiences in a wide range of industries over the years, from surveying to architecture to advertising and to also founding a data startup. Hi, Phil. Welcome again. Over to you. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Out of all of us, I should be able to share. There we go. Fantastic. So hello, everybody. Um, as Mina said, I'm currently a cloud solution architect for data and artificial intelligence. Uh, from next week, I will be moving over to the autonomous AI team at Microsoft, and I'll mention a little bit more about that team later. But today, I wanted to talk to you about a bit about data, a bit about systems, and a bit about intelligent systems. Now, this would be a different take, a different perspective from uh, leases, but I hope you'll see by the end how the two perspectives uh, intertwine. So we look at data first. Data is important. It's important because it gives us new ways of knowing and new things to know. And data makes software smarter through artificial intelligence. Data is how machines know. We can have a different discussion later if you want to about the nature of knowing, but go with me with this for the moment that works and we think about software as the automation of tasks producing data so if you automate an interaction you can meter that interaction you can perform analytics on that data to inform human decisions and to create that learning loop for people what you hope people do when they have learned and they've seen that data is they take some kind of informed action and that informed action could be in a design at that stage. It could be at a different stage when somebody's moving around a building, you've supplied them with some data to, to make a different kind of decision. There was a, a boom called big data uh, about 10 years ago now. It's not a term that I'm particularly fond of because it just meant more data than your current system could handle. But what came out of that, what emerged is this automated learning from data, what's known as machine learning. Now, what this does is it still creates a piece of software, but it does that from the data as opposed to from human effort with programming this, this thing called a model. And you can attach that to the action. But I want you to think of this on the one hand as software derived data, wherever that software is, if it's embodied within a physical system or whether it's uh, sitting in a virtual space somewhere. And also think about, on the other side, data derived software. So building that software from the understanding the world that can be gathered from data. And then we come around to this term intelligent. Now, I'm sure many of you have fallen foul of this, but judging people on what they do and judging their intelligence on what they do. This is how we kind of see human intelligence. And on the other side, you judge a system taking action in the same way you judge its intelligence. Lisa mentioned about the relationship people have with uh, intelligent agents, voice agents, because they're judging that machine's interaction with them that's happening automatically, and they're judging that uh, machine's intelligence. At Microsoft, we think a lot about digital transformation and this digital feedback loop where this data represents signals going in and out of the different parts of engagement with customers or products or spaces and these things um, to allow that intelligence at the heart to grow and develop and inform you as you move forward. When we have these tools, we get to have different kinds of impact. 
So for example, this is a piece of data. This is a satellite photograph of a river delta before illegal small scale mining has taken hold. And this is the same delta when illegal small scale mining has happened. There's a huge impact on the ecology, on society, and on the environment. You can use these new data tools, uh, such as vision systems that have learned to see with artificial intelligence to detect this emergence cheaper and more safely than you can with boots on the ground, which is a traditional method. So you can start to reimagine how people are interacting with the world in that way. You can also take this example, which is about optimization. In this case, it's on a ship. Nobody's going on cruises at the moment. But that kind of optimization of resource usage is really important in this case for financial saving. But you can also think about the impact on the environment that any asset building or ship in this case is having. So bring this back to buildings, we can think about that data when we come to the people and those uh, interacting with that particular object and think about them as at one place at one time. There are these kind of truths about the way people are that things exist in places at times and we have some kind of identifier for them. And you'll see this pop up in the in the data about people and where they are. Now, what can happen here, however, is there are issues with that collected set of data. For example, this idea of a proxy, a phone representing a person as opposed to being that person and that phone being left somewhere can break a link in that system, break a link in that knowledge, which can have an impact on the kind of services that are delivered because of the data. Lisa talked about one form of privacy. I'm talking very particularly here about the privacy of somebody saying, don't use my data very particularly, that breaks a link. It changes the way that you can use data to provide these services. And you can also see many kinds of confusion in the data itself, uh, different ways that people have interacted with services, different identifiers, poor aggregation. Now, what we're doing here is we're thinking about that um, uh, data now from a human perspective. And when we reflect this into artificial intelligence, you end up with a conversation about the ethics of artificial intelligence. Now, Microsoft has a uh, huge amount of material here. You can download the, the ebook if you want to, but I want to focus in on that fairness part. So fairness says that AI systems should treat all people fairly and bias itself is one way that AI can become unfair many different kinds of biases out there. But the way that sort of plays out, for example, is this is a news article about Durham Constabulary and they were using postcode as a predictive factor in custodial decisions. Now, postcode is a huge sociodemographic uh, indicator. Uh, where people live tells you a lot about who they are traditionally because people live in that data. So if you're using that postcode, which is a very strong indicator of things, you can be building in bias to the system that's making decisions. The way that this works is if you take this as a data set, there can be uh, pieces of knowledge about what these pieces of data mean. So last name is an indicator of ethnicity, for example. It could include real world bias, like a survey that doesn't cover somebody's ethnicity, for example, buckets them together with this unknown group for example. So if you do machine learning and you start to, to use this for automation, you're going to start to put people outside of the system. But if you process that data and you think about what that data means, you can start to look at things like access to services and you can remove more and more problematic pieces from it for example. In this case, this has abstracted the issue away from postcode directly. And now we're getting the artificial intelligence system to think about distance to services, in this case, hospitals. So we can think about people's relationships with buildings as objects through the data mediated by computers, devices, and AI. But if we take that forward and we extend that, we have to think about the complexity of these systems because saying the past is a predictor of the future is a bit of a fallacy. There can be a load of problems in there that mean you can't predict the future from the past because change happens all the time. And this is where we start to think about 
the system of it, whether it's a closed system where you're in control of everything and you're able to make those kind of predictions, or you're in an open system where there are lots of interactions with that environment and there are lots of things you can't measure. You become part of this system of systems. Now, that simple system itself is easy for us to understand in a number of ways. We can think about a system and its environment. So you can think about the building and where it is, the people and the elements and those things. They each have this controlled boundary. And this is a, a very useful quote in this case that you've got to think about the fact that that boundary is, is made up. The system is not closed. The system is open in more ways than you expect. But what we also know is when that boundary disappears, we've got to think about it as a form of death. The boundary no longer defines that object anymore. And so we don't think of it as an object, it's dispersed into it. But that's very different from being an open system. Now, if you look at this uh, system here, what we're talking about is the exchange this system has with its environment, a plant in itself. And uh, I love Derek's comment there coming up in the chat. Yes, I think we should be learning from nature. And this is a very good example why I hope that this plant is taking energy from the sun and it's going through a chemical process of photosynthesis um, to produce oxygen and the physicality of the plant. But the plant is doing something else as well. It has its boundary and it's using the fact that it has a boundary to reflect some of that energy as information back into the world. And so every system has an exchange of energy and waste. Things are coming in and things are going out. It also has this exchange of information. And as we know, with energy exchanges, you optimize them. And when you take it from an industrial perspective, you'll say that this is very good. The trouble with that is you're externalizing this waste just and you start to think about the system as closed and that waste is disappearing, as it were. You can also think about that from an information perspective. Uh, what is informationally wasteful? What is being over optimized? So, you know, burgers as a kind of food. unhealthy. Now, I was just muted then for a second. So closed linear systems are easy to think about in a lot of ways. They do very specific things. Opening up the system and thinking about it as open is um, much, much harder. And you need to have a new paradigm when thinking about it. So one of the new paradigms, and this relates to my new role, is this idea of reinforcement learning. And this is saying that the building itself as a system needs to learn. And there are many ways to do this. And uh, HVAC control is a, is a really good example of this, where traditional methods of optimization as the building is a closed system are reaching the end of their utility. They're doing very useful things. But what they're not doing is giving us the extra gains we need now um, as the world is getting more complex. And you can read more about that case study if you wish to at another time. But what we're seeing here is you've got to think about the building as a system and how our relationship with that system through data control and simulation changes that conversation. How are we thinking about this as where the boundaries are, where we're having those interactions with the system, which are the boundaries? Are we inside? Are we outside? Is the system closed or is it open? Data can help us here as well, but sometimes the data is not good enough and we need to think about the system, the model and the simulation that we're going to put in place. Now, um, just a, a, little, uh, a little promotion here. Um, come January next year, uh, a book I've written called Data Guide to Humans really focuses in on this idea of the interacting paradigms and perspectives between systems, how that works in the world of data. And Lisa mentioned empathy right at the start. I focused in on something called cognitive empathy, which is a very rational act of understanding the paradigms of systems and how that relates to our use of data and our impact on the world. The last piece I want to talk about here is the concept of identity. Because if we take that technology and if we get that right, the technology should fade into the background and people should start interacting 
with the world around them in terms of its intelligence and start having a relationship with that system as if it has this identity. Because then there's a different form of relationship, a different set of responsibilities and the reciprocity that uh, Lisa discussed. And I think about it as that you start to have this expectation of a duty of care. And this means we've moved beyond the idea as this building is an object to produce data, to run software and these things, and having that abstract idea of the interaction through the idea of this building as a system with a boundary and different interactions in that environment, all the way through to this idea of the technical foundation giving the building this identity that people are interacting with. And that changes the way that we have to think about uh, the way we're mediating those interactions, both through data, but also with the actual people who are there in that environment. And there are two great examples from science fiction. If anybody's seen Altered Carbon, a recent version of that's been put on uh, Netflix, this idea of the intelligent hotel. And once you're within that hotel, the hotel has a duty of care on you. And this is played out in science fiction. There's another one called Town, not as good a uh, film, but an interesting idea of this building having an identity and that duty of care is a key part of the relationship uh, with the people who use the building and its services. Thank you very much for your time and for uh, paying attention. Uh, as you saw, a very different perspective from Lisa's, but very happy to, to join in and uh, take questions. Thank you very much, Phil. Wow, we have been, I think, blessed with two fascinating presentations today. Thank you. I would say thank you for so clearly distilling the very complex world of data and machine learning for us. And I personally quite appreciate the way you have been describing how data provides us new ways of knowing and new things to know. And I think the other aspect that I, I want to touch upon a bit later on as well is the leveraging data's capabilities to optimize resources use is definitely something that is very critical in today's context uh, where climate and biodiversity emergencies demand us to all minimize our impact on natural resources but hopefully we can elaborate a little bit more later on um, now i actually wanted to uh, start uh, the q a session of this event and um, and i think there there are hopefully questions that will come from the audience as well but if i may just start the conversation um, by asking the first question to lisa Lisa, as we had mentioned earlier, we're increasingly relying on the intelligence of buildings we live and work in to offer efficiency, to promote interaction, enhance health and well-being, provide security, among many other things. Um, in this context, how can we ensure that the built environments we design are still human-centered or citizen-centric? So I think so much of this comes down to actually including the people who are going to be experiencing the building, experiencing the product, experiencing the service into your research. I think it's really important to um, bring those people through with you into the design and research process. And we have found that by doing this in our own work, that we actually any kind of tech anxiety or technophobias that people had around the technology, if they give, get, get given the opportunity to participate in the early design and research of that, you find far greater acceptance. As a result of that, you find far greater trust. And as a result of that, you have already established now the basis of a relationship. And that is one of the ways that you can, you can do that is, um, but it's about really understanding that you as a designer are designing for somebody else. You're not just designing for you. And so you have to bring those people on the journey with you. They are experts um, of their own experience and they are going to be having to live with that product and that service. And so um, I just cannot emphasize that that kind of empathy and that kind of leaning into who is going to be uh, really the, the end benefactor of this, you need to include them in that process. Thank you, Lisa. I cannot agree with you more on that because um, as, as an architect, I tend to criticize us as architects well, and by not necessarily when, when there are opportunities to engage with the end users or occupiers of the buildings or the built environments that we design is great, but uh, we don't always get that opportunity. But sometimes we also dismiss that opportunity, perhaps unintentionally, because we believe that we can design what's best for them without necessarily understanding 
uh, what is really important and what's best for them. Uh, so I think that engagement with the occupiers and end users of the environments we design um, as built environment professionals is really important. So we need to design with people rather than for them. Uh, but thank you for that fascinating um, answer. Um, I wanted to turn to Phil. Um, Phil, I just wanted to emphasize that nowadays, perhaps more than ever, unfortunately due to the current global pandemic we're facing, perhaps, we hear even more um, terms and, and much more frequently used, such as facial recognition of technologies, facial recognition technologies, intelligent buildings, or smart cities, and digital twins, and sensors, and so forth. So I'm wondering, do all of these concepts have AI in their foundations? And also, maybe just a, a bit more clarity, I know you've touched upon this in your presentation too, but what is artificial intelligence exactly, and how does it really influence the evolution of buildings in the future? How do you think it will influence the evolution of buildings in the future? Thank you. It's a very detailed question. And I think when you said, what is AI exactly? I think that's a, a really good question to, to poke technologists on because artificial intelligence is a sort of set of technologies. And what I describe it as um, very much the way that we interpret how those technologies are interacting with us. And I, I choose to describe it like that because there are so many different ways of looking at technology. But actually, if the technology is intelligent and if it's an intelligent machine that you can interpret as human, that's kind of the goal of what AI is going for. Now, what I think is a really interesting evolution of that is we think about machine intelligence or we think about building intelligence. So you talked about IoT, we can talk about digital twins. There's a huge set of stuff in that extra technology. So even more detail and even more confusion. But if you think about building intelligence, if you think about that as opposed to how AI fits within buildings, you start to go, well, there are certain things that the building can understand from data interactions it can have. And there are certain things that needs this other kind of simulation space for it to learn and understand. That's much closer to digital twins. People don't describe it like that. But I think um, many people worry too much about going, oh, I must understand what the technologists are talking about, as opposed to going, actually, what we need is this and asking the technologists to come to them. Thank you, Phil. That's, uh, that's quite fascinating the way you're trying to explain this very complex world, I think, in um, in sort of layman's terms. And I greatly appreciate that. And there's quite a few questions coming through the chat that I'm actually watching as you were describing. And if I may actually address the next question from our audience to you again, Phil, um, because I think it relates to what you just touched upon. Um, and it's, I think it's a very um, exciting, interesting question, actually. And I think many of us are thinking of this in the back of our minds. Um, is there a danger technology advances so fast that it becomes divorced from human beings? Would you think in the future hmm. that technology is going to take over if, you know, if that's even, <laughs> that's even a concept that we can entertain? So I think science fiction has a, a lot to answer for when it comes to these kind of questions. And I think um, very interesting to see what Lisa thinks uh, after I've shared a short piece. Um, but I think I take uh, Karl Popper's a philosopher I'm very fond of at the moment, and he talks about this space for objective knowledge. These things exist now. Whether or not things take over is up to us. This is all part of our space and they're changing how we are as people. They're changing the world that we're interacting with. Taking over, I think I worry more about the medium term of people using these tools to manipulate others. So the machines themselves are as we build them. I think worry more now about how people are using the machines, not whether some piece of science fiction that you like or dislike is going to become true. That, that's a, that's an interesting perspective. Um, Lisa, I actually wanted to ask you sort of, sort of building up to that original question and reading another question from the audience um, around the similar notes of whether um, we can make machines more human. And you talked about reciprocity and almost empathy um, in your presentation. I'm wondering how do you think the machines of the future may influence um, whether there is an opportunity for them to influence us positively and how do we sort of engage with the machines of the future and also today as well? Yes, so, uh, you know, I think um, like, like Phil was saying, 
thing or me now make people's lives. Um, lots of amazing technology in in um Lisa, I believe you're breaking up. I'm not sure if it's just on my end. Um, can you hear as well? Sorry. Yeah. Oh, goodness. I don't know what else this to do, I'm afraid. Fine. <laughs> if you You've returned to see your answer, that we can hear you all right now. Okay, perfect. That's great. <laughs> um, yeah, so just to uh, reiterate what Phil was saying that I think in the sh in the short to medium term, one of the things that we need to be more concerned about is how technology is actually being used by very powerful people uh, to create certain kinds of impacts in the lives of others and certain kind of consequences in the lives of others. But we can we have seen lots of ways and how technology has positively created um, improvements in people's lives. There is a age in the history of the I our headset. Lisa, we, we seem to be losing you. Um, we were hearing you quite well before. Uh, I'm not sure if maybe temporarily turning off your camera may help. I think I think we may have lost her entirely. Hopefully not. Sorry. Sorry. Could you hear us well, Lisa? Can you still hear us? This is unfortunate when we're talking about technology. <laughs> technology is failing us today, but <laughs> hopefully, um, uh, hopefully we can join. Uh, we can be joined uh, by Lisa shortly again. Um, maybe Phil. I'm also mindful that we are cl uh, closely running out of time, mm -hmm. and hopefully, uh, both Lisa. Uh, sorry, Lisa, that you got interrupted, but hopefully you wouldn't mind. I actually wanted to slowly start bringing the session to close um, by firstly giving an opportunity to both of our speakers to provide their closing remarks. Hopefully we can have Lisa back in a moment as well. And also later by highlighting just few key messages that we heard during today's presentation. Um, Phil, if you wouldn't mind going first, uh, what is your key takeaway that you would like to share with our audience? I think both uh... <laughs> The key for me, uh, we're on a journey on how we perceive the objects around us. Those objects can be buildings and we can think of things as objects. And as Lisa you know, says, you can think of things as products or you can think of things as systems. You can think about how those systems work, not individually as objects. And then you can start to think about how those systems develop identities based on their interactions. And that's the key journey for me, because when I'm out in the world, when I'm interacting with the spaces around me, those spaces mean something to me through their identities. And so if we're starting to use these technologies to evolve the identities of the spaces and the objects and the buildings and the systems we interact with, we will be uh, improving people's lives and we'll be focused on that because of the empathy that Lisa describes, as opposed to thinking about optimizing the objects. Thank you very much, Phil. Um, and I unfortunately, Lisa, I believe can't join due to Wi-Fi issues, but I can. She's kindly shared her uh, closing remarks or key takeaways on the chat, which I would love to 
read. Um, so she actually says that technology has had some amazing positive impacts, especially in the medical and healthcare spaces. From how health apps have been able to change behaviors like walking more or managing anxiety and depression and to provide social health care at the distance, um, there is an opportunity for incredible advancements in telemedicine. So I think that's an example um, of how technology can really influence lifestyles and behaviors positively moving forward. But um, I want to thank both of you, Lisa and, and Phil, for joining us today on this exciting event. And hopefully all of our audience have joined today's session as well. And if I may just wrap up this event by providing a, an overview, a summary of um, the exciting conversations we've had today and, uh, and the insights that Lisa and Phil were kind enough to share. So Lisa talked about the foundational pillars of trust and empathy and the spectrum of surprise and expectation where serendipity um, lives on one end and consistency on the other. And Phil iterated the importance of how interaction with data must be carefully viewed from a human perspective and how the ethical side of artificial intelligence is essential to avoid unintended bias. And his emphasis on boundaries and systems thinking was, I thought, also very relevant to our thought process within the built environment context where buildings, people and the natural environment um, are all a part of the same ecosystem that ideally should coexist in harmony. And we're all collectively, globally working really hard to make sure that there is that harmony and balance found between the built environment, the physical environment, uh, humans and um, and the natural environment. And I think technology really plays a significant role in help informing and, and changing, hopefully, lifestyles and behaviors of humans. Um, so um, close to the end of the hour, uh, this brings us to the end of today's event. And I would like to thank again once more to Lisa and Phil for taking the time to join us and give us uh, such exciting uh, insights uh, and a lot of new knowledge, at least for myself, that I'm uh, I'm walking out of this session uh, quite well, better understood uh, in terms of um, in in artificial intelligence and technology and how that actually interacts and impacts uh, human beings and, and our decisions and choices we make every day. Um, and I also want to thank the audience for joining us today. I have you enjoy the session as much as I did, and we look forward to seeing you in our future events. Thank you. Thank you.